Well, welcome to a uh, COUCH interview. COUCH is an acronym that stands for uh, Celebrating Our Wildlife Conservation Heritage. And this is a program that was uh, initiated by the Wildlife Society back in 1999. And basically it's a, um, a process of capturing oral, uh, oral history interviews of uh, people that have essentially made the wildlife profession over the years. And uh, a lot of the kinds of information that is transferred in these uh, tapes is uh, not the sort of thing you'll find in files, but it's, uh, it's between the ears of the, uh, the people and the professionals who have, uh, have lived it. So our, uh, our guest today is Ross Heyer, who's uh, recently retired from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources uh, in, uh, from Crookston and other places, which Ross will get into. So, Ross, to launch things, if you could give kind of an overview of your your personal history, where you were born and raised, and sure. a little bit of an overview profile of that. Not a lot of uh, dimension in our in our history of our family. All right, go on. Sorry, camera. And Ross is very much a uh, a dog person, so it's it's kind of appropriate that we have a little visitor. That... <laughs> Out. Sorry. Go but on. that is uh, is very much a part of the uh, higher family. So yeah. it's it's, uh, it's kind of it's kind of cool. I always had my door interruption happen. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, I grew up in Jackson, Minnesota, in Southwest Minnesota, and. Jackson County. Jackson's the county seat of that area. Uh, I'm a prairie kid. And my mother grew up in that area. Leela Mae Berryman. My dad's from western South Dakota, the little town of Gettysburg, near the near Mulbridge, near the, the Missouri River. And uh, his, his, my grandfather built all types of milling machinery. And he bought and furbished, refurbished a feed mill in my hometown. My dad came there to help with that and whatnot. He met my mother at that time. And there's five kids in my family. My oldest brother, Mark, my oldest sister, Melanie, my next oldest sister, Lisa Jane, myself, and my little brother, Stephen. So, Stephen, the baby, is, he'll be, good grief, he'll be 60 this year, so. And my older brother is 71, so time has gone by. Yeah. So did you inherit some of those uh, working with your hand genes from your grandfather, perhaps? Not mechanically, or ele he was a brilliant electrician. He actually built the first power plants in South Dakota. Wow. He was from Springfield, Minnesota, um, but an electrical genius. I don't get any of that. My dad was a tremendous. He gr he graduated a chemistry degree from the University of Minnesota. He's also a brilliant mathematician, physicist, all that. I I didn't get any of that stuff. <laughs> My mother's side, I think, is where I got. You know, my creativity and my passion. My dad was a very good man. He wasn't uh, emotionally exuberant like I can be, but um, my mother always had pets and she loved, you know, creatures of all kinds and still does. Um, my I was dad, thinking she's still living. She's right? still living. Yeah. She'll be 94 in October. And my dad, uh, he just passed away in 2000. Um, seemed like pretty old age at 76 then, but for him sitting now it doesn't. But um, You know, he was just the kind of man that uh, served in World War II. He was a naval officer and then um, recalled for the Korean because he had stayed in the Naval Reserve to help raise his family. <laughs> mm. Having no idea there'd be another war right around the corner. Mm -hmm. But, you know, he came home and um, his life was his family, and he, he did an amazing job of raising both of them, raising kids. 
you know, I grew up in the era, you did too, of a homemaking mother. Um, I can remember many days our high school wasn't that far from where we lived. And always walked or biked to school, elementary, and mm. like you did. Um, I chuckle today when I see kids in the neighborhood get picked up by a school bus because they would have been, oh, well, nobody, there just wasn't that policy when we were kids. But I often came home my senior year to have lunch with my mother, and those are memorable. Memorable meals, mm -hmm. you know. So, other than the typical education part of your early years, how did you uh, spend the rest of your time? Well, I was hobbies. I was certainly the most about. outdoorsy kid of our my class. I mean, mm -hmm. I I was making T-shirts with a paint called Artex. It's a fabric paint. I was making T-shirts my sophomore year that you know ended up being worn by a lot of kids, but think ducks, you know, and had some species of duck, and because I was so nut, duck nutty crazy at that point in my life, you know, seeing them, handling them, hunting them, um, you know, I was, I, would, I excelled in baseball, I didn't do any other sports, um, but, you know, playing baseball in the north is brutal. <laughs> I was recruited by a couple small schools like Bemidji State or whatever. But mm. I realized I don't know if I was that good. I was a good hitter, but I don't know if I was that good of a fielder. But I just knew biology degree took quite a bit of work. And any kids that do athletics in school at the same time, my hats off to them. It's, that's got to be pretty challenging. But so I was either up at Jasper's Creek, which is now. You know, at that time it was a pasture, catching skinks and garter snakes, and it's all houses now, you know, developed. The town was only 2,500 when I grew up, and uh, I could literally take you to five big marshes I hunted as a kid, and you, they're just gone. You know, they're, they're so drained that you wouldn't recognize that they could have been a marsh, but some of these were 40 to 60 acre basins. Yeah. But, you know, I was on the tag end of tremendous pheasant hunting. And I remember my senior year, I think I shot 68 roosters or some ridiculous number, you know, mm. without even really trying that hard. But I was active in uh, choir. I always sang madrigals, folk group, loved it. Um, Any jobs uh, always, that you were involved always in? Always jobs. Um, yeah mowing lawns as a little tiny guy and for, we have two college students here again I appreciate you coming but you know protect your hearing you see these little gems I have in my ears um, some of that's from shotgunning and stuff but a lot of it's from lawn mowing and, and uh, even on the job with pump engines that you know eight fifteen hours a day standing next to them not good you know, so protect your hearing, but yeah, lawn mowing, I always had a paper route, which I look back fondly because we paper route guys we felt were, you know, we had, a, we had the cat's meow, you know, I mean, we met at Poindexter's store and picked up our papers, and at that time, a sack, a little, they were paper made, but uh, sunflower seeds for a nickel, you know, you get your pack of sunny seeds and shoot the bull with the guys. I remember when Mountain Dew came out. You know, I remember a green bottle that was so foreign looking to us with that little hillbilly head on it and said, Yahoo, Mountain Dew, you know. <laughs> I never cared for it, but, you know, a lot of my friends thought it was just unbelievable. So, always had a paper route, and then once you started gaining, I was such a little guy, you know, I was like, I weighed less than 105 pounds right through high school. I doubt I ever reached five, six, maybe at that point. But always uh, hoeing soybeans, weeding soybeans, or detasseling corn, or working in various other farm situations. I was a city kid, but detasseling corn can be a little monotonous after a couple hours. Yeah, especially when you're so short, you're about <laughs> having to jump for every tassel, you know. And then during my time, you know, they came up with a machine that, that the tasselers were sitting up and reached down like, like mm. this. Um, 
you know the, the tassel and corns about or yeah so they left the mail rows I, I remember right mm -hmm. five two five two something like that or hmm. but eventually they just came up with a they were just cut the tassel off right below the tassel and when I learned that it happened probably when I was at the university but my first thought was what are all those kids going to do that had such good jobs mm -hmm. at DeKalb mm -hmm. and such is life I guess but we've seen it all, every year or something so yeah always a you know good work ethic in our family all of us I want to do a little profile of your educational experience for us. Let's say you started in the high school and through the university yeah. scene. Um, graduated from Jackson High. It's now a consolidated school, Jackson County Central. So all the little towns that were our nemeses are now part of the system, you know. And, Jackson always had, you know, they, they my, through my senior year, they won the Southwest Conference in football like 17 straight years or something. Oh, but I was just a fan. Yeah. But, um, you know, very good wrestling teams. Um, but I, I did graduate in 74, and, you know, I wasn't a top student, but I was, I was a B-plus <coughs> student, whatever. I didn't, we didn't seem to have the homework kids have today by any means. But, um, and sadly, you know, we only had art through ninth grade, which hmm. I would have loved to have really had more art. Mm -hmm. I, I still don't know what I'm really doing, but it's just a school of hard knocks mostly. But somehow you seem to be getting by. Though. Well, not when I look <laughs> at other people's work. And, but I don't want to name his first name, but Mr. Olson was our consular and you know in those days they'd call you in whether you were a F student or an A student and what are your plans and I told him I wanted to attend my dad's alma mater at the University of Minnesota and I was going to become a wildlife biologist and he he sat I remember vividly him sitting back like this and him saying you know Ross I'm not sure your college material and I never knew if he said that to light a fire under me or, but I thought, well, if I'm not college material, <laughs> who is college material? <laughs> I knew it would take a lot of work, which, so that kind of set me on my road that next fall then, you know. And my last, you know, four summers I painted houses professionally, interior, exterior. Um, my high school sweetheart at the time, we, we went together for almost five years into college years, eventually breaking up, but her sister and her husband owned a paint shop in my hometown, and so Dave took me under his wing, and I owe them a lot. They, you know, I was making, you know, $9 an hour when other kids were making three and a half or whatever, you know mowing weeds or whatever, but, you know, I learned how to airless spray, and I still love to paint houses, and, but we did, you know, inside the gymnasiums at high schools and barns, and that was, it was fun. The bottom line is I came out of my high school years with really quite a sufficient bankroll to pay for several years of college without really having to worry about Nice. You know, we were on the quarter system, as Terry had mentioned in his interview, which I've taught in the semester system. You have both, but I really prefer the quarter system. I mean, I got to take way more classes. They were intense as could be, but you could take so many more subjects in a four-year career, and um, it went fast. Mm -hmm. But. So then I went on to the U, and uh, you know, your first couple of years at the U, you're on the Minneapolis campus, and I guess my other students quickly learned that I was this wildlife nut, and because uh, one winter day I remember this guy from like two floors above me in Territorial Hall said, hey, is there a Ross Hire here? I said, yeah, that's me. 
He says, well, there's some bird out here on the parking ramp we want you to identify. That was a snowy owl sitting on the top of a parking ramp right in Washington Avenue. And, and they were so impressed that I, I mean, even if you didn't know what it was, you'd call it a white owl or something, you know. But they were impressed that I knew that and uh, seemed to give me a little bit of respect in the Well, in that day, there were cigars called white owl cigars. That's right. Yeah, I still vividly remember the commercials. Yeah. And then after, you know, a year and a half, you tended to spend more time in the St. Paul campus where I felt much more at home and smaller. Um, still took the bus back and forth sometimes for a class, but I had, uh, you know, my undergraduate years were, and you, you, you wish you weren't so naive, you know, I mean, this is how naive I was. I mean, a lot of my classmates were, were from the cities, and uh, that kid sitting with the number 37 shirt in that photo, holding some ducks there. He was from South Minneapolis. He's from Minneapolis Roosevelt, and uh, he kind of took me under his wing because I arrived, you know, wearing cowboy boots and um, you know Western pearl button shirts, and you know none of these, none of that was in vogue or whatever the proper term is. And I remember the first day of uh, signing up for classes, old coffee hall, which had these windows look like an old bank tellers mm -hmm. from out of the western mm -hmm. movies. So I'm standing in this line with about 50 people in it and all these new guys I just met that morning to you know meet your friends or whatever are in this line and you know the lines are moving I think yeah Ross you're doing this you're, you're right on. You know, I get up you know one from the window and one of these guys said hey hire yeah you're in the wrong line. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'd been standing there for an hour, and Tom came over and he put his arm around my shoulder. He said, "Don't let these." So I, you know, I'd lost him to pancreatic cancer. He uh, mm. he worked on white fronted geese up in Alaska the last 15 years, and uh, yeah, I miss him badly. But he was a guy that you know, obviously meant a lot to me early in that part mm. of my career. But you know, I had tremendous professors. Uh, Dan Franzel was my first manager, uh, first uh, advisor, and mm. here's another naivete. He said, "I think you could take 22 credits." <laughs> my first fall, <laughs> I said, "Okay." You know, and it actually, in the long run, it worked out because you know my GPA went from like a 3.8 to a 3.1 over my four years. I mean, I think I ended at 3.3, but. Basically, what I'm saying is, I wore out, and I but I had so much energy that freshman and sophomore years that so I'm glad he did that. So you made 22 credits. I did it, yeah, and I I think I was just under 4.0 that first quarter. Wow. But and uh, you know I had Bill Marshall, Peter Jordan, Dave Parmalee, John Tester. These are all big names in Minnesota, mm -hmm. um, and I had one. You know, I took every speech class I could on the St. Paul campus because something just told me, I mean, Terry mentioned it earlier that we wildlife people don't think you have to deal with anybody, but something deep inside me just said, well, I think you're going to have to learn how to talk to people. And so I probably took four speech classes and every literature course for that I could. <laughs> and Tom Hanks was one of my teachers. I had him for three quarters. Tall drink of water from the Ozarks of Missouri, your home range, about six eight. Um, but you know there were kids in there. I, one of the classes I took from him was uh, short story writing, and you know I quickly learned that I wasn't in Kansas anymore when the the four letter F word was in amongst some of these kids' expositions, mm -hmm. and I thought. Wow, you can like write that word and be graded on it and get an A. That was that was a big, big thing for me. But that Tom Hanks was he was uh, really important to me as far mm. as you know understanding that you don't have to live this non-progressive life. You can 
still be a good person but still think liberally socially. Well, was that somewhat unique for someone to have a, an affinity for uh, communication classes? Definitely in my and class being, it uh, was. a wildlife type yeah. guy. Yeah, in fact, I took so many speech classes that towards the end there I actually worked as a like a speech assistant to a couple professors to help oh. certain kids that were struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nobody else did that. Right. And it, it wasn't that I couldn't speak well, but I was such a shy kid, which is hard for anybody to believe now, but that helped me get over the shyness. You know, impromptu mm -hmm. speech class, you have to get up there and, and that certainly fit well for me in dealing with county boards and mm -hmm. I mean, like yourself, you know, you're comfortable in front of people. Um, you know, the, the other thing I wished I'd learned quicker in undergraduate school was there aren't any wrong answers. I mean, you might be wrong to a question, right. but so what? Right. You know, and I tried to instill that into my students when I taught out here is, you know, raise your hand and say something. So, yeah. so what if you're wrong? You've learned something. So. What other uh, resource management classes were particularly uh, memorable? Well, Bill Marshall's, uh, it was kind of a, I think he put it together more or less, but it was a hodgepodge mm -hmm. of Sand County Almanac to, was the mm -hmm. Bible mm -hmm. for the class. And it was just basically a think tank kind of for seniors or juniors, he was gone my senior year, to talk about various land management things, mm. which even though I had that class, it still never really hit home because, you know, most kids coming out of the U at that time were not well established in what I think now of basic land tools. Yeah. In fact, I, you know, I led the DSU ornithology trip yesterday morning locally and just to see where they were at, I turned to these young people and I said, we were talking about Glacial Ridge, and I said, it encompasses more than a township. Does anybody know how many sections are in a township? And nobody did, and I said, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, I'm just trying to show you that I did not know that coming out of the U. Mm -hmm. And the simplicity of how do you, you know, how do sections marked in a township? And that did come up in various interviews in my life, mm -hmm. you know. And, but. I don't recall a class that really ever taught me those basics of, you know, surveying what I guess, but we didn't have that. But mm -hmm. how to read a plat book, you know, what's an 80, what's a 40, what's a 640. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Any other classes besides resource management classes and besides communication classes that were particularly impactful? Well, I had a vet anatomy class, mm -hmm. which was, you had to get permission to take it because it was vet students and about five of us wildlife people got into that class. So we were sprouts among these older students, mm -hmm. but it was a marvelous class, but it also coincided with at the Como Zoo that year, a leopard died and the zoo bequeathed it to the vet department and we got to dissect that thing. Wow. And a young woman named Nan Kane, do you know that Nan? Yeah. Yes. Huh? Artist. Yes. Nan was a classmate of mine. Okay. And as we were dissecting this amazing creature's right front paw, opening it gradually, she was doing these unbelievable drawings of all the ligaments and mm. I can still see her sitting there. This gal was very earthy, you know, almost hippie like. And I never knew what became of her later in life, but well, she did illustrate uh, mammals of Minnesota. That is that what it was? Because I've seen her work, right. at least in that a couple The guy from Bemidji State published. Um, but so that had a but David Parmley's ornithology class, which tied together two dynamite professors. David Parmley and Bud Tordoff. Mm. And Bud Tordoff was in kind of the ecology part mm -hmm. of the U, so I wouldn't have never met him otherwise. Right. 
and at the he was then the director of the Bell Museum. Just Toward kidding. That, yes. Okay. And and my spring quarter certainly was the most definitive at Itasca mm. back when they used to do that. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'd never been north of St. Cloud. You know, I mean that was way mm -hmm. up north to me. Mm -hmm. And to go to Itasca and be in a cabin right on the lake for a quarter, <laughs> and then Bud comes up with his English setter Sally, and again this is just dumb luck, but he said anybody want to go out and ban Woodcock? I never, I didn't know who Woodcock was at that time, but for some reason none of the other kids, and I saw he had a cane on. I thought, wow, I don't care what I'm missing today. No one said me. No one no said me, me, except me. <laughs> and I spent the whole afternoon with Dr. Tordoff wow. capturing little woodcockies and banding them. And, you know, it's amazing I didn't. Well, our family's always had Labradors, but the way that Sally dog worked, you know, she'd point the hen and the brood, and he'd say, Sally off, and she'd just go lay about five yards away and just lay down, and we'd capture the. She was so well trained, it's funny I didn't gravitate towards English setters, but I'll always be a Labrador guy, I guess. But mm. that, you know, I got to work with Bruce Fall at the Itasca. Uh, he was a postdoc ornithologist under Tordoff, and he was working on warblers in the um, Lost, whatever, Lost River Bog or whatever it is in the park. And I wanted to work on golden wing warblers. And so Bruce was missing, so for several weeks there I got to handle, you know, as the mig warbler migration mm. came through, you know, bay breasted. I mean, just these outrageous little birds that were like Fabergé eggs, you mm. know. And <laughs> I remember walking into the mist netting one day, um, it's just this ridiculous shrill of some creature. I, I mean, it was just horrific sounding high-pitched, and I said, God, what is that? And Bruce said, that is a leopard frog in the jaws of a garter snake. Mm. I'm thinking, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. We walk about 10 yards, there's a garter snake with a leopard frog in its mm -hmm. jaw. And I've since seen that and heard it, mm -hmm. but it so impressed me that a guy knew that, and I knew that he knew that only one way, by being out there. Right. Right? So. I realized a big lesson there that you have to be out there. Mm -hmm. You can do everything in an office, but you don't smell, see, or hear the, mm -hmm. the wildlife. So Cool experience. Yeah, it was fun. Well, from there I went to New Mexico State. First I banded ducks for half a summer, and you know, my wife's from Southeast Asia, and Asians always say things, things come in threes you know, whether they're bad or good, but I literally got three phone calls from three different schools in a 48-hour period. And the first one was New Mexico State, mm. the second one was South Dakota State, the third one was Oregon State, and then I had a couple later that said, we don't want you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd never been south of Kansas, and thought of going to New Mexico, it just seemed like an enchantment, like a dream. Mm -hmm. So that's where I had it. You mentioned your wife. How does she come in your life? Very luckily for me. Um, my now brother-in-law, who's from Black Duck, Steve Baltus, he and I both worked on ringneck ducks early in our career in Bemidji. He's a couple years older than I am. and. You know, at that time in your career, they keep you on for three months, 28 days, nine hours, 12 minutes, and 12 seconds, and then cut you loose, so they went not have to tenure you. Mm -hmm. And Steve had done this. I mean, that's just paying the price. I realize that. You know, I'm lucky to be able to pay the price. But Steve had had enough, and he, he foresaw that he probably wasn't going to make that much money in wildlife. It's that money isn't really important to him. But I think at that time it maybe was. And so he said, I'm quitting and I'm joining the Peace Corps. And he went to the Peace Corps and worked on Sumatran rhinos and met my wife's sister, Christina, who was a police officer at the time. 
And I don't know exactly the story there, but um, got married in Malaysia and they moved back to Bemidji just because I guess he wasn't going to stay in Malaysia and Bemidji was close to his hometown and my sister-in-law could get a nursing degree started there and that's what she did. And she had a long career for the Department of Health. She and I were the same age and Steve went on to work for 3M and had a long career. But so Christina was the first Malaysian student at Bemidji State. And Bemidji State at that time, like a lot of our colleges, are trying to open funnels to different mm -hmm. nations to, to bring kids over. And so I guess the doorway was open for Malaysian students and Leela came. I was in New Mexico still, but she came over in 81. and I would see her biking around campus in 82. You know, she had that beautiful overbite and I fell in love with her the first time I saw her, but I didn't know what the family logistics were. Um, my brother-in-law, I remember we were hunting scop one day on Turtle Lake by Faustin. He said, you know, Leela's got obligations to go back home. I said, don't tell me that. You, you married her sister. And, well, she did stay here and marry me, which I, you know, I don't know if I could have done that for her, switch countries and all that, so. Mm. Yeah, we'll be married 34 years in June, so. Neat story. Yeah. She's a smart one. <laughs> I mean, everything I have is because of Leela, because I'd still be living in my rental house of Pomidji, because I am my father's son as far as finances. I'm super conservative fiscally, not a risk taker. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when Leela and I met and we talked about getting married, and she said, well, what do you, what's your plan? You know, I'm like, huh? You know, <laughs> plan? You know, I've been banning ducks. I'm just, it can't get any better than this. She said, well, you know, you can't be banning ducks when you're 40 or what. I, I really never thought that way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we wrote down some plans, and uh, so many of them have come true. Mm -hmm. But it's all because of her. I'd be pretty lost without my marriage, that's mm -hmm. for sure. Back to the uh, professional career scene and journey. Uh, you mentioned some of your part-time uh, experiences, but after you received your master's degree, how did you break into the more career track? Uh, uh, was, again, that's where knowing people, you know, don't ever make enemies. I mean, Terry said it, he taught it to me, but I, I understood that before I worked with him. You know, I drew a cartoon once and I gave it a talk where, you know, this old guy sitting on a bench you know, obviously a decrepit old man, and uh, these two young bucks come by, and, hey, old man, what you doing? Old fart, you know, hey. And, you know, they didn't need to do that, but years later, one of them is a wildlife manager, and he comes into the county board to try to get some permission to buy land. Well, who's sitting on the board? That old man. Is he going to get that land? Maybe the old man won't be malicious, but a lot of humans are. So yeah. I understood that and my parents preached that. I mean I grew up in an all-white society but you know, my parents had African men from from Africa obviously but through our Presbyterian Church. Uh, so I met, you know, I just had never seen a black man before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess this will be on tape but one of them I'll never forget his name. His name was Jukero uh, God from, uh, I think he was from Sudan, and he was so black skinned. And he was staying in my little brother's in my room. You know, we got shifted over. And I remember boiling up the stairs one day with my little brother, and we just, out of, you know, everyday movement, we went right into our bedroom. The door had been closed. There's Gad standing there, stark naked, changing clothes. And Stephen goes, even his peepee's black. <laughs> you know, like what? He's he's just gonna be black from here. You know, so a little life lesson there that well there's other peoples, you know, there's 
other races, there's other lines of thought, and uh, you got to take all those in and, and keep them there, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it, it's probably not surprising that in my family, uh, you know, two of us are are married to East Indian people. My brother's oldest daughter is married to a second generation. Indian. His mm -hmm. parents both doctors in Chicago came from Mumbai, um, and my oldest sister's married to a, a Syrian man, a Syrian, not Syrian, but from mm -hmm. Bethlehem, a Christian man. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'm pretty a religious, you know, at this point in my life. But um, just never, you know, when I brought Leela home. My mother's name is Leela. My wife's name is Leela. It's spelled differently, but you know, nothing but welcome arms, you know. And mm -hmm. So I'm really lucky in that respect. Mm -hmm. My parents, though my mother never got a, beyond a 12th grade education, she's very worldly. Mm -hmm. and, and my father had seen a bit of the world in the Navy, so it's good. So, what's your first. Uh Professional track career job with Minnesota DNR. Yeah, DMR. sorry. So then, after graduate school, just to stay alive, you know, we used up our stipends, and Steve Merchant and I, um, I got us a job in Louisiana on the lead steel shot study, just to keep us in food for about four months. Then I came back and I did some illustrating for some professors at New Mexico State on some books they were writing. And then I got the phone call from my former boss, Todd Eberhardt, mm. at the Bemidji Wetlands office. And he said, I need you to come back here and lead the Mid-Continent Mallard work. And, you know, it was the best phone call of my life. Because mm. I knew at that time I would have a chance at having a, not just a job, but a career with a section of wildlife. So it started, you know, about seven or eight years in the waterfowl research office. First under Todd, and then Dr. L. Afton working on Scott. Mm -hmm. So I got to work on Mallard's ringneck duck ecology, and then Scott migration ecology. And that Scott migration ecology, well, L's such a good scientist, you know. I mean, that was mm -hmm. just top-notch science. Was he based in Bemidji? Yeah. Then. Yeah. And now he's down south. Well, now he's retired at LSU, and he's. Oh yeah. But he's well, he moved, went to LSU. Yeah. From he's, from here. he's moved back to Bemidji now. Oh, okay. Retired to there. He's a Jayhawker by birth, but so you know those. He's in uh, Kansas. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> those years in Bemidji. Uh, I remember Jerry Martin's was you know I owe him a lot. He's he's the one that kind of pushed me to try management. And uh, back then you had to take a test to get on a list to be interviewed to get a management job. Hmm. And. You know, it turned out at that time we just had hired, for the first time ever, we were having assistants at all these field offices. So Carlstead, Thief River, Glenwood, Crookston, Detroit Lakes, etc. And the way those managers worked it out, they almost they didn't draw straws. But I learned later that Terry said I I would like Ross as my assistant, which worked out really well for me. But I hemmed and hawed for about three days because I thought at the time that, you know, waterfall research was where I wanted to be, but... Had you worked on ducks for your masters? No, I actually worked on mule deer. Oh, you really? know, okay. And desert cottontails, hmm. you know. No, I didn't work on birds, which surprised a lot of people, but mm -hmm. that, that was a good thing, too. Mm -hmm. Masters, to me, was just a lesson in research and dealing with people and writing. It doesn't necessarily have to overwhelm the world. And the critical thinking process yeah. and that whole, yeah. that yeah. whole piece of it. So, yeah, you know, Martin he came down to our wetland office three times. He was at the region, and he said, well, what's the answer? <laughs> I finally, you know, I mean, I was just sobbing. I said, I'm going to take the job in Kirkston. I'll, I'll go, you know. 
May of 1988, I made the lonely drive over here because Leela was working and we didn't have a place here. Um, stayed at the old motel that sunk into the river mm -hmm. that's gone. Mm -hmm. um, those people treated me like gold mm -hmm. and uh, you know brought me suppers and stuff. I mean, I, I knew immediately it was good to be back in a prairie town. Um, I mean, Bemidji is nice, but I've always kind of felt people are in that, well, some are born there, obviously they're woodland people, but mm -hmm. I never knew my neighbors in Bemidji. I mean, hmm. they weren't overtly friendly like out here in the egg, you know, interface. So. so, you know, and then my father came up, and uh, that's where you really like to have a parental unit, you know. I mean, he, my father worked in a bank then, and he was an appraiser, and so he understood homes. And, mm -hmm. and we found 513 Holly, and uh, I called Terry and told him, you know, that these people at the bank seemed to be kind of hemming and hawing about loaning us. He marched down there and, you know, said this kid's good for the mortgage, and so I can still get emotional about that because I don't, you know, I've never been as nervous in my life before buying our first house, which was in Bemidji, but right. I mean, marriage, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, working, but putting your line, your name on the line for like $80,000, it just seemed at that time, just how will we, how will we do this? But, Would you sketch some of the... Uh changes in the wildlife profession since you've been actively engaged in it? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'd say I was really lucky to, I mean everybody says they're happy to be born when they are. I mean these young fellows obviously will say that, but every decade that goes by there's a chunk of habitat missing that was there, you know, two years ago or whatever. Um, but I got in on that early era of, of simplicity. I mean, like I, I said in Terry's interview, that, yeah, we literally would you know, take our paper we needed and walk down the street to Woodseth Smith Nolting and Ruby Lacassier had a running tally of copies we made and she'd send us an invoice every month. So simple. Mm -hmm. I mean, Andy Griffith-like, which, you know, I'm a firm believer in Andy Griffith, the early parts of this show. Because, and it just, you know, our quest at that time was we got to work at a little before 8 and we typically were in the field by 8.30, you mm -hmm. know, three days a week if not more. And I loved that. Um, it wasn't against the law to stop at a farmer's and have a cup, I didn't drink coffee, but have a cup of tea and just mm -hmm. talk. That's not pushed now. I mean... Mm -hmm. They might view it as well. You could be doing some some email or something, um, you know. And I, you know, the artistic side of me, I got to do a lot of things that just don't happen. Now, one example is Terry talked about project maps. Mm. Well, my project maps are, you know, done up a little more than the average one, you know. And I've heard rumors that. The project map for Thorson Prairie, which had uh, upland sandpipers and otters and kingbirds, some other stuff in the margins. The original of that is still taped up in the wildlife building in St. Paul. As it should be. <laughs> I don't know, but the point being that it's shifted all to computer driven mapping, and, which I understand that. But, you know, when Terry talked about, this is Terry Wolf I'm talking about, talked about you know, signing an option on the hood of a pickup, and you might have even done that with some of your land dealings, but I look at the system now and it's it's not a swipe at the DNR, it's a swipe at society. Mm -hmm. That we've become so sophisticated, much of it with nothingness, that it, life just isn't as uh, creative and buoyant as it was early in my career mm. and you know then email came on and you know when email first came on I mean Terry and I we would check our email maybe once every two weeks <laughs> we you know we never saw any need what what could be a problem now that 
wasn't a problem, the same problem five years earlier that could wait for days on end to be dealt with, either a letter from the region or a phone call. And you know, the things were getting more complicated as far as um, the learning curve on soft, you know, software was coming in, and, and I certainly felt like I was falling out of my element at that point. Um, I mean, I, I, I dealt with that for probably 12 years of my career, but we got Ruth Ann on board. Ruth Ann Frankie was our first technician, and you know, thankfully she was a little younger and she helped us through some of those struggles. But by the time my career ended, there was a directive that we had to check our email first thing in the morning. And I never saw that as a good statement. Mm -hmm. I just, we're field people, we're supposed to be field people, and I struggle with that greatly. Aside from the uh, computers and that technology, how about the other tools? The other parts, of course, <laughs> are excellent. Equipment, yeah. for example. The safety of burning now is I marvel when a fire gets away from somebody because, and they're so well trained, of, you know, like the yeah. roving crew is just, these guys are cracker jacks, guys and gals. Um, he has some pretty nice machines too. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, literally to go from a three-wheeler pulling a pump trailer with a Honda 11 horse on it to these, well, I mean, they're bigger than my room here. and. And cost like sixty, seventy thousand. I suppose cost more than our budget was for a couple of years, but you know I appreciate that because it's pretty obvious now that the mom and what I call mom and pop's burning of the local field office is going away. You know, we we have to rely on the roving crew, which is trained to the hill, and they're really good people, and so you're going to be probably burning bigger chunks of grass. I can live with that. That's you know, as long as we get some burnt grass in the landscape, and it allows them to burn in time periods that maybe we we're afraid to, or yeah. or not afraid, but couldn't go through a wet seep zone. No, the equipment is amazing. Vehicles are amazing. I mean, my first pickup in the in the uh, wetlands office, it didn't have air conditioning, of course. It didn't have a radio. Um, crank up windows, of course. Um, air conditioning? You expected air conditioning? Well, no I didn't, because I didn't have it in my personal oh. vehicle. <laughs> what I'm saying compared to vehicles now, right. all that stuff is just part of the package. Yeah. But it also costs, you know, our fleet program in the section of wildlife is one of those governmental units gone wild, you mm. know. And Gretchen Mamel, the manager at Red Lake WMA, I remember years ago she gave got on her soap box and gave a passionate speech about not vehicles so much as much as tractors and dozers and mm -hmm. she had worked it all out. If we rented locally we'd save the state, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. But mm -hmm. it just you know, they have their avenues that are set up now and yeah. that's how government works. Any other major issues that come to mind in the evolution of your career journey? Well, I was always treated so well. Um, you know, never had a bad day at work that I can remember in 35 years. Um, the local community was generally behind us. That was a lot of because of Terry's Lake work. Um, but I do feel, you know, I was there for the heyday when. You know, we didn't think we were in the money, but we were. I mean, we had good staffs. We had staffs of staffs of three to four people per area office. Now it's down to mostly two. Mm. And the current manager for Polk and Red Lake Counties, who was a former student of yours, she is hired as the area wildlife manager on a three-year basis. Mm. Not a you know, it's not her job for life. I hope it is if she wants mm -hmm. it, but mm -hmm. it's like we've gone to, you know, the Major League Baseball where you mm -hmm. sign a contract yeah. and then they they just say, well, we don't think we're going to renew. Mm -hmm. That's no way to treat people. Um, 
I've always have felt that the section wildlife treated their people really well, but I, I think we're starting to see a little rust on that. I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe in a lot of agencies, probably. If you were to list the highlights, and, and you've, you've mentioned many of these, but uh, any other highlights of your career where you were really flying, or were there just so many of them? Because well, I you think sound like an optimistic guy. The man that's interviewing me has, you know, led me into a line of work that I never thought I would enjoy so much, and that was teaching at mm -hmm. University of Minnesota Crookston, where Today I feel I feel sad that I had never met these two young students mm -hmm. that are well not that young they're seniors whatever but men of the world soon because I relished those years mm -hmm. when I could walk on campus and students would hey Ross and mm -hmm. I would say hey John or whatever and I can see where professors get a great joy mm -hmm. of teaching because mm -hmm. and uh, you know I've heard from a lot of people that I did have some positive influence on them and uh, this, this basket for example it was made by Keith Estes dad I've shown you that before but that's an ash basket and Keith Estes who is an Ojibwe man he is a student of mine he's from the White Earth Heath Heath, Heath isn't it Estes. yeah yeah Heath um, he presented that to me on the day That's of the, the final one. exam, his dad had made it for me because he was so wow. happy that somebody, I, one of my chapters in prairie ecology was on native people, and, which I have a large library of and a, a deep yearning to learn about them. And, and that just, I mean, I, I still don't know how to accept that gift. I mean, hmm. that's as earthly as it comes. That's beautiful. I met his dad and his uncle. I have, uh, I have met his father. Ago. Oh, maybe Benji. Yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think what his dad's name is. Well, I think Kent is his uncle. Okay. But, yeah. But little Thank things you. like that. I mean, and you, you know, you led me that direction. I can remember vividly writing a letter to the region, basically begging between sentences. Because this was unknown at the time, could a section of wildlife person go teach at a major mm -hmm. university? Would it be considered, you know, outside your work? Or I mean, it was outside my work. Mm -hmm. It was a night class, but. Or, but yeah. Jerry Martins did at UMC. Oh, did he? Before I came. Okay. Well, he's the one that signed off on that. So okay. <laughs> you know, maybe I had the right person in the right chair at the time. Mm -hmm. but eventually, it was just accepted yeah. that I could teach out there. Yeah, he taught one or two courses okay. out there. No, that was a huge... And I've watched that university. I'd say if, you know, if uh, I can get a little cynical about my own section, I don't want to be too much, but... The U of M Crookston, under your leadership, a lot of it just went from a two-year school to this. I'd, if I had kids and they were interested in wildlife, even if I was in another state, that school would get a strong look. If I had anything, to, I mean, the kids can do whatever they want, but the hands-on and the ability to jump out to Timpanucus and look at, I mean, you didn't do field trips like that at St. Paul. That'd be like the act of God, you know, to go out and do something. Mm -hmm. So kids here at this university are really, they have a, a good deal going. Any, uh, any other high points or any, any low points? Again, being such an obvious... Well, I think, I think the low points are the things that we can't control mm. very well. And to me, that's the importation of noxious plants. Mm. I mean, it went from zero to three million in about five years, and nobody really quite knows what to do. I yeah. mean, and new ones keep coming on. Right, the and you know, if you attack them with herbicides, well, then you're kind of preaching out two sides of your mouth, and we don't know what else to do. And uh, hybrid cattail is certainly is a disheartening thing. 
Uh, you work to try to use that plant. Um, I say that really as, you know, depredations. I, I never view depredations as a dark thing mm -hmm. because after the person that's called you and you go meet them at their farm site, you know, the occasional one might throw a swear word at you or something, but it's all, they're just characters that make my fabric. <laughs> And that's how I viewed them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from those you get some of the best allies you could ever get mm -hmm. if you can help them. And, you know, we typically did help people. Mm -hmm. um, I think High Points is when Ruth Ann came on board and um, she was the missing link to a, really the perfect team mm -hmm. because I strongly believe, ever since Ruth Ann came on board, that every office should have another gender. If I'm a female, there should be a male in the office, or if I'm a male, I think there should be a female, mm -hmm. just because Terry and I would say black, and Ruth Ann would say white, and, you know, or if this was a boulder, we were going to move, Terry and I would, ah, let's move this, you know, we'd try to muscle, you know, Ruth Ann would hook her rope up to and pull it out with a four-wheeler. Yeah. <laughs> I so vividly remember the first time, you know, and she was a nervous wreck coming to work for us, pretty seasoned land managers. I mean, she'd managed in Florida, but, you know, mm -hmm. she said that really wasn't like you guys do. But she, she came into the pickup and she put a box of Kleenex on the dash. And Terry, I mean, it's all tongue in cheek, he said, Kleenex? <laughs> That's what these flannel shirts are for. <laughs> <laughs> well, she just, you know, we found out that she was a bull terrier and, you know, she could give it right back. And, yeah, we were a well oiled machine when Ruth Ann came and, you know, we spent the next, well, 12 years with Terry and then almost 14 with me. So mm. we did a lot of good stuff. We had fun every day. And, uh, you know, people ask me at retirement, what's your worst recollect? I, I don't really ever remember having a bad day. I'm sure there were mm. some, but the good days were always, you know, I mean, for goodness sakes, I was getting paid by the people in the state of Minnesota to work on some of the best prairies on the planet, yeah. not just the state. So you didn't have any days where you felt like uh, you were kind of on the edge and maybe your, no. your life and well-being was in jeopardy? You know, there were periods during the like burn, burn, burn season, like I mean, your brain is always engaged, <laughs> yeah. you know. Since I retired, I've hunted, I've hunted turkeys locally one time, I missed last year because we were overseas, but I'll probably hunt them again this May. Mm -hmm. But I was talking to some kid at UMC who, you know, evidently hunts them every year, and I said, I shot one, you know, 29 years ago, the only one I've killed. And I hunted him about five years at that time. And he said, well, yeah, you're right. Now you're right in him. Why didn't you hunt him? I said, because come March, my brain is consumed with fire. Mm -hmm. Every road I go down, my brain's thinking, fire break. Where mm -hmm. would you do if it went this way? Or, which isn't a bad thing. Right. But it, it is all consuming if you're going to do it right. Yeah. That's why having the roving crew is a benefit to managers. So... What about turkeys? They're new on the scene. Kind of yeah. different. Yeah, and I helped put them out. <laughs> I fought that. I fought it a bit. Terry was neutral on it, but uh, yeah, national turkey. So now on prairie chicken uh, censuses, we are turkey gobbles. <laughs> or see them. Yeah. Both, yeah. 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 They seemed, I mean, this winter I thought would, that February might put the herd on, but I've seen quite a few birds. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're tough honchos. I'll mm -hmm. give them credit. They're a magnificent bird. I just didn't think that they should be this far north. I helped release giant candidates too, of course, in 1991. <laughs> I think they're going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did all right. Of course, they brought us a lot of work for depredation issues like a decade later. But success begets success. Any uh, particularly humorous experiences? That come to mind. Well, they typically all get back to my relationship with Terry and, and generally from cleaning wood duck boxes. 
because she just never knew what was going to happen. Um, we'd been, he and I would work late. We worked long days in the winter cleaning boxes. Enjoyed every minute of it. We'd often be coming back to Crookston in the pitch black, and uh, it was a cold, you know, probably a December day. But Terry had a big hooded, this green overcoat he wore, and uh, the hood was laid down on the bench seat of the pickup, and just enough glare from vehicles and stuff. I was just turning to him and talking to him when I see a deer mice, deer mouse come out of that hood <laughs> and walk across the bench seat. <laughs> I said, hey Terry, you've, you've had a traveler with you for the last 35 miles, you know. And we did get that mouse out of the pickup the next morning, but, but uh, you know, he talked about my episode of the mouse, but uh, there was another one on the poke unit where we were working together that day, and um, he was going up the tree to, to check this box, and the ladder was on ice. It mm -hmm. was a shallow base, and it was frozen solid. And he said, "Make sure you keep your foot on that bottom rung." And you know, I mean, the ladder had bit into the ice a little bit, but you got me. I said, "Oh yeah, I got you." You know, and he taps on the box top like we do to. You know, nothing came out, so he pops the top like this, and this deer mouse comes out like Superman, just <laughs> flung itself out of this hole, and I jumped about 25 feet, let go of the ladder, it went choo 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 choo, and Terry caught himself. <coughs> he, he got the ladder, huh? <laughs> I'll never forget that mouse, just like, its eyes were as big as mine were, you know? So. Every day, like I said on Terry's interview, there wasn't a day that didn't go by that we didn't laugh. I, the only thing I can equate it to is there was a TV show called The Barnwood Builders on, on the Do It Yourself channel. And these guys are in West Virginia and they take down log structures and re, mm -hmm. rebuild them. Or, mm -hmm. And these guys, it gets back to your famous uh, Hammerstrom statement, good works need not be done in sepulchral atmosphere. Yeah, sure. These guys are doing their work and yet they're smiling and laughing. It can be done. Yeah. And I'm lucky I got in on that type of a situation. I never had a bad boss in my life. Ever. So what would you tell people that are giving uh, some thought of uh, an exploratory nature of uh, going into the wildlife resource management? Part field if, in some capacity. Yeah, I'd say go for it. Number one, you walk out with a difficult degree to get, but it's a good degree. Mm -hmm. It allows you to branch. Well, here we have an enforcement kid and a parks kid. You could go parks, water, fish, air, soil. You have this biology degree that is strong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can remember as a dumb freshman at the U, you know, sitting with other kids in like a social studies class or something. Well, what's your major? Economics. What's yours? Biology. Oh, biology. That's hard. I, I didn't really, I didn't know it was hard. Right. But, and I think, you know, you have, you have thousands of students across the nation. Whether they got a job in wildlife, I'm not sure is that critical, but if they got a job that made them the best human being they can be, mm. that's critical. Mm. Because in that respect, you're still going to do your best work. Mm. And on top of that, you might have a soft spot in your heart for nature. You know, so. What do you consider your three most important contributions to the profession as you've been involved in, in various capacities over the years, research and management and Ironically, to me, it's working with people. I never thought I'd ever say that because I always mm -hmm. consider myself kind of a misanthrope, I guess. <laughs> I like people, but I don't want to be around a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But I've been able to touch, you know, you've helped me in that. Uh, others have helped me. I've been able to touch a lot of lives uh, through my artwork, through 
my general, I guess, passion of wildlife. Um, and I think, secondly, I know I wrote some of this down because I knew I wouldn't be able to, to uh, think too much about this. Um, yeah. Could you expand on your artwork? Because well, people, when they think of Ross Hire, they think of your artwork along with your management capabilities and, and successes and, and human relationships, and, and it's just in, inseparable. Yeah, well, I appreciate that statement because it is what I am. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember when Leela and I got married, and you know, it's funny how wives. When you're dating, they didn't think you hunted that much, but when you get married, they suddenly think you're in the field hunting a lot, you know. And I said to her one day, you know, I, I'm a hunter. It is what I am, and that's... I've always been guilty of showing my emotions on my sleeve. I don't know, some people call that a bad trait. I, I'm happy for it, but... It, you know, I, I learned my artwork is strictly, you know, maybe there's some gift there from something, but it's strictly through my passions mm. for the natural world. I mean, I think about that every time I touch a pet dog. Here's a creature removed from a wolf, maybe what, a few thousand years? Mm -hmm. And I can touch its muzzle and it doesn't strike me? I just marvel at that. Mm. and. Uh, so my art has been able to, it's certainly led me down roads that I never would be able to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's gotten me to places, I've gotten to meet a lot of people because of it. And uh, I think you know, what it's taught me is people are always impressed with passion and not so much ego. You know. Your passion shows through in it, whatever you do, whether you're a fireman or a secretary or whatever. Well, I would comment that I think one of the reasons why Aldo Leopold was so effective was that he was quietly passionate. Steadfast. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Five. Yeah. You know, the days go by now in my 60s. You can't play the game of what can I get done? Because I've been kind of lazy in retirement in some respects, but you know, I've donated a lot of art or those kinds of things, but active in the chicken society. But I've also fished a lot and traveled and hunted, made decoys, painted. But I think as far as my watercolor work, the best paintings are ahead of me. Hmm. Definitely. Neat way to think about it. But there's always ideas, you know, I mean, when people commission me to do something, <coughs> it may take, you know, like Russ Rice and his wife commissioned me to do something years ago. Mm. I haven't finished it yet. But the ideas just haven't fallen into place yet, but mm. they're always rolling in my head. Whereas I, I need to do something for the chicken meeting Saturday, and I haven't started it yet, but it'll happen in the next two days, I guess. You've touched on this, but any uh, more individuals that have shaped your life, career, motivation? Yeah, you know, my uh, right from the get-go as a five-year-old kid, my next-door neighbor, she was a spinster. Margaret Gillespie was her name. Her parents were from, directly from Scotland. And uh, she'd suffered from polio as a young child, so she had kind of a disfigured face, and she scared a lot of kids. but. She was a librarian in my hometown. I adored her. And she gave me my first bird book, Birds Every Child Should Know. I still have it. Wow. I mean, it's over 100 years old, that book is. Yes. It's downstairs. It's not on this bookshelf. But Margaret and I would play dominoes at least four times a week. And we played for sugar cubes. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, when we go down after the, you guys can see what Margaret gave me for our wedding gift. She's deceased now, but 
that's hanging in our dining room, um, painted by her mother, who was a brilliant artist and then just quit when she started. I mean, this was painted in Scotland before she immigrated over. But Margaret, definitely my parents, for sure. Um, they let me have free reign on fishing in the Des Moines River. I mean, I marvel today, an eight-year-old going down to the Des Moines River and fishing. There was no thought about drowning or fear that some old geezer would snatch me. Or, I mean, that just, you know, we grew up in an era where my parents never even locked their home, even when we went on vacation. Mm -hmm. You were probably like that, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think we had locks. Yeah, outdoors. probably. Amazing, huh? A better world in that part of society. Um, but then Todd Everhart had a huge influence on me, Bob Jessen in the weapons office. Mm. And, uh, you know, some professors in my graduate years, but more of the students that I was with. Mm. And um, I've lost one of them, this gal here, right here, Kathy Cheap. She worked for the feds out on you know, Umatilla on the river and her plane went oh, on the, the river. Oh, the plane went down. Yeah. yeah. Remember that? that was 1998. She was one of my housemates, and mm. so I've lost a few friends. But you know, this kid here, Steve Merchant, just retired from our section. Um, mm. and you were in grad school with him, right? Yeah, Next we met in graduate school. Yeah. He worked on lesser chickens, mm. and um, you know that bugger's down on a Centrark admission right now. He's fished in. <laughs> Missouri, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and now he's in Guadalupe River, Texas, mm. fishing for all these different weird largemouths and different sunfish. But, um, and then coming forward, uh, Leon Johnson of the mm. Rob Naplin. Mm. Rob had a big influence on me. He mm. was a quiet, steadfast man. Mm -hmm. The biologist that we lost, he fell off his roof cleaning the gold iron. Uh, sewer vent pipe. Night before a regional meeting, we arrived to find mm -hmm. out he had been killed. And, um, well, you know, my time with Terry um, and you. Um, my time on the west side, you know, Carl Matz and Tony Rondo, federal people. Jerry Suri, everybody I went, people took me under their wing. Mm -hmm. I I don't know what it is, but I was really lucky. Not, you know, I got to meet Al Hockbaum because of my relationship with Al Afton. Mm -hmm. I mean, what little young biologist gets to shake hands with Al Hockbaum, you know? Mm -hmm. and, um, that's just been a blessed, a blessed career. Your mention of the librarian that was an early influence on you. I did the first couch interview with Art Hawkins. Wow. And he had a paper out in New York. New York? That's where you grew up? And I asked huh. him about early influences. And he, on this paper, there was a little old lady in tennis shoes type person yeah. who really liked birds. And she exposed him to migrating warblers. Wow. He, and when he was in his 90s, he still remembered how pretty they were. Yeah. And she gave him his first pair of binoculars, which wow. were a pair of opera glasses. Cool. <laughs> There's some history. Yeah. Wow. The, no, I think... little story, but yeah. along the lines Well, I think, your, you know, as a young person, if you get that special mentor that somehow sees in you that, you know, in my case, it was nature. I mean, to get a book that you know, every page you turned out a story about a bird the child should know, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just, and, you know, I can tell you by the age eight, I I knew almost every bird in my neighborhood, of course. Mm -hmm. And they still throw me nothing like them. If you could retrace this path, would you do anything differently? No. I couldn't have. I couldn't have been more proud when I got to say that I finished my career as a wildlife manager for the state of Minnesota because I, mm. I deeply love my home state. I mean, I've lived in a few other states. Um, Louisiana was amazing, but there's no public land to speak of, at least in the southern half. 
Texas, there's no public land. New Mexico, 81% public land. Mm. I could live there. Yeah. But, uh, you know, my father's home state, your home state of North Dakota, they've socially they've gotten so conservative now that I just, I, I really struggle with that. Um, even Wisconsin. Um, but generally, everybody, they're good people, you know. But, um, this idea that we can live without wild places, they don't have to be that wild, yeah. you know. Just think, would New York City exist without Central Park? I, I don't see how. Mm -hmm. Because people would war on each other if they didn't have that element to get out into. Yeah. And You know, we take it kind of, we have a peaceful evening in a Midwest town here. Beautiful. Yeah. But, you know. Any further thoughts on the future of the wildlife profession, given all of the well, variables and changing dynamics of one sort or another? Well, the big change for wildlife and fisheries is going to be this <coughs> continual, gradual loss of hunters and fishers. Uh, you know, we saddled that horse for our finances decades ago. Mm -hmm. And that formula isn't working anymore. I mean, we're, we're squeezing it to work right now, but it's just inevitable, I think, the way society is going, that it's going to be <coughs> darn hard to, you know, fishing, I think, is one thing it's easier to attract a kid to, but hunting and trapping is just, like, mm -hmm. unfortunately, way out there. Mm -hmm. um, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, you know, when I hunt in Saskatchewan, to think that that entire massive country, there's less than 50,000 Canadians that waterfowl hunt. In the whole province? In the whole country. Oh, the whole country? I believe that's a statistic. Why? I mean, they're all in the metro areas in yeah. Canada, very much like Australia. Yeah. Sydney, Perth, Adelaide, Canada, it's Vancouver. Calgary, Saskatoon, Winnipeg, Toronto, etc. Yeah. It's emptying out. And uh, <clears throat> so to continue on, you know, we're, we're lucky we follow your home state's legacy of having the, you know, the Lassard funds. And that's still going here for a while. And I mm -hmm. think society will realize that that has to be upped even more. Because it's high time. One of the biggest lessons Bob Justin, who was the former waterfall biologist for the state out of Bemidji, one of the first times I worked in Bemidji, he had a fondness for you know doing this and gazing into the distance and he'd say, Young man, do you know what your main responsibility as a waterfall? hunter and biologist is. You know, I'm thinking, you know, band as many ducks as you can. This is the responsibility right here. We got to keep the funds going. Yeah. That was a big lesson for me, an easy lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, show it to me in three dimensions. But society is going to have to quickly come to the realization, and I'm, I'm disappointed with my fellow Minnesotans right now, we have to raise up, not as hunters and fishers, but just lovers of clean water, mm. uh, soil, nature. It has, it needs to be funded. Mm -hmm. It's as a critical to us as having a car to drive or working. Well, with the international travel that you have done, I'm sure you've, you've seen many, many uh, poignant examples of what the lack of clean water yeah. does. Yeah. And the limitations that, that yeah. puts a whole spectrum of things. Well, I think it's your protege, John Wagerin, that has that. Wagerin has. Mm. Travel is travel the, is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, yeah. blah blah blah. Yeah. That's all that wonderful. And well, yeah. that's so true because yeah. you know, we sit here and yak about climate change and 
I've been in places in India or, or other places, we're, we're there. I mean, the water yeah. is so bad yeah. that you and I would die if we took one drop of it. Yeah. And this isn't something that's a hundred years down the road. Or right. even in my home part of southwest Minnesota where many of the farmers that you know, were heavy into hogs in the 60s and 70s, maybe they still are, can't drink water from their own wells because of nitrate poisoning. Yeah. And that's, you know, society just kind of says, oh, well, that's that's probably bad, right? So, yeah, that's a red flag. Let's yeah. fix it. Yeah. You don't want to deal with the hard issues. But. Well, to wrap things up, you mentioned earlier, Ross, that you're somewhat a religious, but one thing that comes to mind when I hear you talk about not only your accomplishments in resource management and so on, but the, uh, the long string of uh, friends. And I forget who said this quote, uh, but and that was uh, to the effect that to live forever in the hearts and minds of our friends is to never die. I think you're there. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Six thirty. Time for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're not worn out. Oh, we'll see. These young men probably are. Uh, they, no, one's very enjoyable. I huh? suppose. Yeah. Thank you. You need some energy for your Easter.